Uh, this morning, not so much a message. Um, last year, I think I preached on two things. If we weren't here, who would miss us and would we be missed? And uh, I gave some examples of that. And I kind of wish I just had a stool right now, but I'm looking at that stand there and I don't think it would hold me up if I sat on it. So uh, this morning I just wanted to share, I came across an article months ago and then it came back up in my Facebook feed this, uh, I don't know, probably in November. And I'd been stewing on the idea of uh, talking like about this, but uh, it just didn't come up in the series that we were doing. It didn't have, uh, there wasn't an appropriate time. So I thought this morning would be a good time since, uh, sadly, I mean, since it's kind of an odd week. It's the first of the year. It's a direction that we're going. And I have, um, I've got some things I just want to point out and I want to challenge us with, I guess. Um, it may seem critical. I don't mean it to be critical. Uh, and hopefully you'll see by the end that it's not from a critical spirit that I even give this talk. But this morning, it's kind of, I just want you guys to feel like we're sitting around in a living room and um, I'm just sharing something that's on my heart about the church in America, our church in particular, and a direction that we're going to be moving this coming year. So um, I, I want to start out with um, a little bit of human psychology first off. Uh, if I had a, if I brought a little girl up here, let's call her Annie, and I begin to tell you a story about Annie that, you know, she lives, we found her under a freeway overpass and she's kind of disheveled looking, and um, she doesn't have a home, but her mother kind of works and does odd jobs, but they don't have a place to live. Your hearts would be breaking already. And then I told, if I told you that her dad had already passed away uh, at the age of three, and she's a little eight-year-old girl, your heart would go out to her in compassion. If I said, this girl needs some new clothes, there wouldn't be a single person in here who wouldn't open up their wallet and wouldn't open up their life to this little girl named Annie as she stood here with me, right beside me. All of our hearts would go out, but there's something, I don't know why it is, but there's something about our psychology as humans. Now, if I took Annie and I put her in a group of 10 kids up here, and I said, all of these kids have lost their fathers and they live under freeway overpasses, you would look at them and go, you would start to get to the point where, see, Annie was something that we could do. So, she was someone we could do something for. But if I brought 10 of the same kids up here and put them on the stage and said, now there's 10 kids who are in the same situation, you would go, oh, man, I don't know what I can do. And already, our psychology probably brings us down to about 50% of us that would say, oh, I, I can do something. And then if I were to go and get 100 kids in the same predicament as Annie, and brought them on the stage, we would begin to feel overwhelmed. And if I told you that across the nation, there are hundreds of thousands of kids that are dying of malaria because they get bit by mosquitoes, we would just feel completely. See, see, we could do something for one little girl when she's standing here in front of us. And there's something that breaks down as, as the need gets greater in our own psychology. I don't know why it is, but it breaks down. We feel as though we can't do anything, so we do what? We do nothing. Yeah. And I want to talk about something. It's an article that uh, I came across probably back in um, early last year, actually. And uh, like I said, it came up in my news feed again. Um, so that's what we're going to dig into today, this article. But before we do, um, this, uh, this today I want to celebrate some things. By the end of the message, we will have celebrated some things that we've been a part of and accomplished this past year. And I kind of want to set the tone for this next year. And I want to ask for your help in shaping our community and being more and more involved. There's a story in the book of Luke. And uh, it's been popularized um, uh, it's, it's a parable. It's, it's a, a set of parables, actually. We find ourselves in Luke 15, verses 3 through 7. And it says this. It says, Then Jesus told them a parable, a story, as he was teaching. It says, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he does it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. 
I think Jesus in this parable was talking to us, speaking to us much about the psychology that I was just speaking to you about Annie. Many of us are very willing to do something for the one, but when it becomes 10, when it becomes 20, when it becomes a grouping, when it becomes a whole community or a whole country, we lose interest drastically as we see the need go up exponentially and we feel helpless to do anything. And, and I'm not talking, I'm not going to talk about missions this morning, and I'm not going to talk about the need for everybody in our community to meet Jesus today. I'm going to talk about the need that our ch- church, the church, the American church, has grown tiresome to many people who are in a younger age demographic who see the church as insignificant and that it doesn't do anything good for anybody. See, there's a quote by, I think it was um, Bill Hybels. He said, the local church is the hope of the world. And I believe that because God's church, Jesus Christ came and died on the cross and he planted his church. And here we are today. He planted his church across the sea. And here we are today, 2,000 some odd years later, worshiping a God because it came and penetrated our lives based on and gave us hope to live this life after Christ. And what I'm saying is this, is the way the church has evolved in the United States since about the 50s, we've become very stagnant in what we do. And we've created a place for people to come and hear another message and to uh, it, have an experience, but it doesn't, it doesn't drive them toward action to go and meet the one, the needs of the one, or the needs of the ten, or the needs of the hundred. And what I want to talk to you today about, and there's this article, I'll give you the title for it in a second. There's an age demographic, basically between 22 and 35. See, the 22 and 35, I'm not even in that one anymore, and I hate when I fill out those surveys, and it's like, what age grouping are you in? It's like, yeah, I used to be in like the 30 to, you know, 32 to 38 or something like that, and now I'm like 39 to 45, I checked that one, and some of you are probably a little higher than that, and some of you are lower than that, and you're laughing at me right now, but uh, as I feel that I'm getting older, I feel like, and even working at Costco, I, I see these younger students, these, these people coming in, they're going to school, they're working, they're literally 15, 20 years younger than me, and they're not in church, and they're not following Christ, and there's this whole generation of people the millennials, 22 to 35, we talk about them as an age group, right? Now, I, could, I wish I had a millennial I could bring up here and do an interview with. I don't have one that I, that I know that I could interview. So I have to talk about the group. That's why I talked about our psychology because I think you guys are going to have a hard time getting over the number of the group. That, see, there are these millennials out there. We call them millennials. We group them into an age grouping, 22 to 35. And the previous generations, my generation, see what happens typically in the church is that kids that go to church, they grow up in church, and then they hit 18, and they go to college, and maybe they go out there, and they run around for a while, but then they marry, and then they have children, and they go, you know what? I want my children to have the same experience. I want them to meet God. I want them to have that church relation, that relationship with the church and the people in the church, and I want them to have the experience of having the same opportunity I had to meet Jesus Christ. So the family comes back to church in their 30s, you know, 28 to 29, 30, 35. They come back to church, and what sociologists are seeing is that the millennials, they're having children, and they're not coming back. They're leaving the church. Uh, as, a, as a number, I can throw out a statistic to you. 33% of what the previous generation that did come back to church is coming back of the millennials. So 70% of them are saying, you know what? I don't see any value in what I had as a child in going to the church. I want you to, I'm going to stop there, and it's going to be awkward. I want to stop. I want you to think about that. Many of these adults now have grown up in church. And it's not the ones that didn't grow up in church. We're talking about the ones that went to church. They're saying there's no value in being part of the church. Now, Bill Heibel says the local church is what? The hope of the world. I believe the local church is the hope of the world, or I wouldn't be doing this. I believe the local church has the ability to give hope and to change lives and see Jesus Christ move in individuals' lives and see life change and people fall in love with him as he speaks to their life and gives them purpose and has them walk in their destiny. But this group of millennials, they're saying, peace out, sorry, not going back. I'd rather stay in bed. 
I'd rather have brunch. It's more meaningful to have brunch or sleep in than be a part of a faith community. And that's what I'm saying to you this morning. I, I want you to hear what I'm saying, not as a negative, but as a way that we need to change what the church is about. It needs to change. See, we, I believe, because I've been in church for the last 39 years, literally, I, chew, I broke my teeth through the gums. I cut my teeth on a wooden pew. There are marks on a pew somewhere, probably in a little church uh, over in Long Beach, Bellflower, or Lakewood, that our pews went to that have my teeth prints in them. Because I grew up in church, and I can still taste the flavor of that wood <laughs> from chewing on those nasty back of the, oh, why did you guys let me do that? Why did I bite the back of a pew? It's disgusting. People stand up and put their hands on there. But, you know, that experience that I had, and these kids had, they're saying, you know, I don't want to go back to that. See, because over my lifetime, and I believe I've seen this, there was some purpose that the church had but over the last 30 years, the church has begun, I believe, to care more about the experience on the inside than the difference they're making on the outside of the church. Does that make sense? That we, we're more concerned about lights and sound and stage and creature comforts and a cafe in the lobby for the people who are already there. We're, we're more excited about, you know, the new faucets in the bathroom than we are about putting tires on a single mother's car. We, we oftentimes don't care about Annie at all because she's not coming into our church. We don't see her. We drive right past her on the way to church. And see, millennials grew up and they said, you know what, if this thing about Jesus, see, Jesus was not that. Jesus didn't have a church he went to. Jesus walked along and was in the middle of the community and would tell stories and he was among the people. And that's how his church started and yet it has transformed into this, I don't even know what we call it, but it's something that doesn't look like what I believe Jesus would call his church. And it breaks my heart. And the only reason that I do this lead a church, and the reason that Amanda said that we're going to go out our next serve Sunday is, is because we as people have to get beyond the walls of the church to reach people and to show a community that we care and that Jesus cares and there's hope for your life. There are people here who would not be in this room today had we not gone outside the walls on a Sunday morning and met them at the pier or a laundromat or someplace, and there wouldn't be people who are here or part of this community because they wouldn't be here if we didn't go out and serve those same people. And that's what I want to talk about today. I'm going to start with this article. I guess I'll continue. I've started already. It's an article entitled, 12 Reasons Millennials Are Over Church. And it's written by a man named Sam Eaton. He is a self-proclaimed um, millennial. I didn't check on his age, so he could be lying. Anything is true on the internet, right? But this is what he, this is what he writes. I'm going to actually read the first part of it, and he has 12 reasons. We're not going to go through all 12, so if you're looking at your clock, I've only got like four or five of them that I'm going to get through today, and then I'm going to talk to us a little bit more towards the end. He says this, I want to be head over heels for the church like the unshakable Ned Flanders. And if you don't know who Ned Flanders is, if you've ever seen The Simpsons, there's this very charismatic, flamboyant, over-the-top, hi, neighbor, this little, this guy who's just so involved in his church and over-the-top spiritual. He's just so excited about his relationship with God, and he wants to talk about it all the time and everything to everybody. So he goes on to say, I want to be head over heels for the church like the unshakable Ned Flanders. I want to send global sky-riding airplanes telling the life change that happens beneath the steeple. If you don't know what a steeple is, it's like the pointy part that holds the cross up on the top of an old-school church. And we find ourselves in a high school auditorium today. I want to install a police microphone on top of my car and cruise the, scre the streets screaming to the message or to the masses about the magical utopian community of believers waiting for them just down the street. I desperately want to feel this way about church, but I don't. Not even a little bit. In fact, like much of my generation, I feel the complete opposite. Turns out I identify more with Maria from The Sound of Music staring out the abbey window, longing to be free. It seems all too often our churches are actually causing more damage than good, and the statistics are showing a staggering number of millennials have taken note. According to the study, 
and many others like it, church attendance and impressions of church are the lowest in recent history, and most drastic among millennials describe 22 to 35 years old. Only two in Americans under 30 believe attending church is important or worthwhile and all-time low. 59% of millennials raised in church have dropped out. 35% of millennials have an anti-church stance, believing the church does more harm than good. Millennials are the least likely age group of any to attend church by far. And as I sat in our large church annual meeting last month, I looked around for anyone in my age bracket. It was like, it was a little like the Titanic search party. Is anyone alive out there? Can anyone hear me? Turning in and out of the 90-minute state of the church address, I kept wondering to myself, where are my people? And then the scarier question was, why am I still here? A deep-seated dissatisfaction has been growing in me, and despite my greatest attempts to whack a mole it back down, no matter what I do, it continues to rise out of my wiry frame. Despite the steep drop of drop off in millennials, most churches seem to be uh, continuing on with business as usual. Sure, maybe they add a food truck here or a bowling night there, but no one seems to be reacting with any level of concern that matches these staggering, uh, staggering statistics. Where is the task force searching for the lost generation? Where is the introspective reflection necessary when one-third of a generation is anti-church? The truth is, no one has asked me why millennials don't like church. Luckily, as a public school teacher, I'm highly skilled at answering questions before they're asked. It's a gift, really. So at the risk of being excommunicated, here are the metaphorical nailing of my own 12 thesis to the wooden door of the American millennialist church. I'm going to jump into one of them. We're sick of hearing about values and mission statements. We're sick, in, we're sick of hearing about values and mission statements. Sweet Moses, give it a rest, he says. Of course, as an organization, it's important to be moving in the same direction, but, what should easier, or, but that should be easier for Christians that anyone, uh, than anyone because we already have a leader to follow. Jesus was insanely clear about the purposes on earth. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and, lo- and with all your strength. And second, love your neighbor as yourself. There it is. The greatest commandment. Love God, love others, task completed. Love God, love others, task completed. We're sick of hearing about it. How many of you, and I don't want to show of hands, how many of you heard a message about how we need to care for the lost, how we need to care for those who are down on their luck, how many one we can care about, how many people do you know that are in larger churches than this who maybe don't even go out of their way to help anybody in need? And yet the message that Sunday was exactly about going out and reaching their hand out to their neighbor who was suffering. Literally, your neighbor, the person next door, or as we live in very tight confinement here in SoCal, I mean, literally, like our neighbor's door, when I walk out my door, it's right there. We're sick of hearing about it. How many of you guys have ever been around somebody who just talk, 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 oh, I could, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that, and you just go, well, do it already. Like, seriously, like, I remember when we'd have, like, you'd be up on the sky, or the high dive at school, and somebody's like, oh, I'm going to jump off that thing, and then they get up there, and they're just like, uh, you know, like five minutes on the end of the high dive, ready to jump. And I believe that's the position of our church, of the church in America. We're poised. We have all the money in the world. We do. Your average church attender is fairly wealthy. Uh, rich by world economic standards. We have the money. We've got the talent. Good Lord, most churches put on a production that's like Hollywood class theater every single week. Every church production that was done around the nation a week and a half ago for Christmas was top notch. Most, I mean, not everyone, but lots of them were top notch. I mean, the acting, the ability, the video, the lighting, the the microphone, the sound, all of it just top notch. And what are we doing? We're sick and tired of hearing about your values. When are we going to do something? That's what the millennials are screaming. Okay, do something already. Okay, let's go. Yeah, I, I get it. We've talked about that forever. Let's go do it. 
We've got to stop wasting time on religious mumbo-jumbo, just talking about it and not getting out there and doing it. And one of the reasons that I wanted to start a church is because I, I sat back one day and I said, you know, it's really interesting. We call, Sunday, we call it Sunday service, and yet we go out and serve no one. It's Sunday service, and we go out and serve no one. Uh, I mean, maybe we're, and we are, granted, we are serving the emotional and spiritual needs of people as they come in, but to the world that's dying out there, we're not serving them. And the reality is, I believe that every person sitting in a pew or a chair much like this on Sunday morning, if we were to take them out in the streets and get them serving, God would do more in their life through his, seeing his hand of, uh, and his hand and his power work through their life and use their abilities that would grow them more than sitting in church on Sunday morning. I believe that and I've seen it. We're sick and tired of hearing about your mission statements. Let's go do it. Second, I mean, second one, it's not the second one, and I'll share this if you guys want. We'll, like, we can email out the whole article. I'd love for you to read through all of it. Helping the poor isn't a priority. He says this, My heart is broken for how radically self-centered and utterly American our institution has become, the church. Let's clock the number of hours the average church attender spends in church-type activities, Bible studies, meetings, groups, social functions, book clubs, planning meetings, talking about building community, discussing a new mission statement, and now let's clock the number of hours spent serving the least of these. If, if we had a scale, which one of those would be sunk into the bottom and which one would be up? See, we don't do enough. We talk about a lot. We don't do enough. And he goes on to say, ooh, that's awkward. Right? It's awkward when we know that the mission, like Jesus Christ left heaven, which I'm, I'm hoping is much more comfortable than earth. You guys with me here? I'm hoping it's much more comfortable than earth, that there's less suffering. He came and subjected himself to earth, which is not a perfect creation as heaven is. It was, but we broke it. Because he gave it to us like, oh man, you broke it already. You know, that's why, that's why Janie and I felt when we got our first daughter. <laughs> we were talking about that last night because she just turned eight yesterday. We're like, we're going to break her. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm certain of it. But he came out of heaven. He said, well, I'm going to go do something. There's a mess down there. I'm going to go do something. So it's awkward to talk about the time and energy and money that we spend on Sunday morning gatherings and the buildings and parking lots and signage and advertising and yet we do so very little in going out and helping people because helping the poor, poor isn't a priority. These are things that millennials are saying. The next one, we're tired of you blaming culture. Nailed it. We blame everything on culture, don't we? Well, it's because of gay marriage. Well, it's because of this. Well, it's because of abortion. It's because of this. It's because the liberals. It's because of the conservatives. It's because of the, we always want to blame the problem on somebody else, but what are we doing about it to make a difference? Right? Isn't that where we are? I mean, we, we point fingers all the time. The church, I, I can't tell you how many petitions we, there have been in churches or, you know, hey, sign this thing or call your senator about this thing. It's going to affect us. Am I saying don't be involved in politics? No. But don't put your hope in it. Uh, th um, trust me, they will let us down. If you think a tr Donald Trump is going to make America great again, it's not going to happen, okay? First off, uh, let's not even get off on that tangent. I'm not even going to go there. I don't have time. Uh, but I do have a question. When was America great? You go ahead and find out when America was great. Tell me when it was great, and then we'll have that conversation. Because as I recall our history, we may be the greatest country on the face of the earth, but not so great. Not, not in comparison with God's standard of what greatness is. Loving people well. Uh, we have not been a country that loves people well. We've been very self-serving. Let's stop blaming culture. He, said, he goes on to say this, explicitly teach us how our lives should differ from culture and how we can engage it. See, this is what millennials are wanting, that group of people who are saying, I don't believe you guys are relevant. I don't believe I should give an ounce of my time to that cause or that organization or institution. They're saying, Show us how our lives can differ. Show us how we can matter. Show us how we can make a difference and then go do that and I'll be with you. The next one, 
the you can't sit with us effect. He says this, there's this life-changing movie all humans must see regardless of gender. The film is, of course, the 2004 classic Mean Girls. In the film, the most popular girl in school gets, forgets to wear pink on a Wednesday, a cardinal sin, in which Gretchen Wieners screams, you can't sit with us. You can't sit with us because you didn't wear pink and it's Wednesday. Now, you may not feel like this is true, but today, how many people do you, how many, how many people have you ever heard, I think I've heard this my whole life, that people will say that don't go to church, they say, I don't go to church because it's too clicky, right? I don't fit in. I don't know where I fit. I'm not, man, they don't talk like me. They use a different language, language than I speak. They, they talk these church words. I don't even know, I don't even fit in there. They're not wearing pink on Wednesday. They don't even fit in with us. You can't sit with us. He says this, today my mom said to me, church has always felt exclusive and clicky like high school. With sadness in her voice, she continued, and I've never been good at that game, so I stopped playing. Our millennials, they don't feel like they fit in with a typical church culture. I don't fit in there. That's why our sign says you don't have to believe like us to be with us because we want to create a different culture in here where people feel we're really, you can come as you are. Like, I, I feel so good. It's so cool. They call me pastor at church. They call me Pastor Jeremy, which is funny because they found out that I pastor at church and now they'll just throw it out. Isn't that right, Pastor Jeremy? And all my, my coworkers will say it. We'll be leaving and going up the elevator and they'll say, well, what does Pastor Jeremy have to say on that? It's, it's quite funny, but I, the one thing that I love the most, and it's very refreshing with it, being around people who feel like they don't have to put on a mask and live up to an expectation that they think that you have for them. So I, I and you, you might throw stones, go ahead and throw stones, but I love it that the guys that I'm interacting with and that I'm having an impact on, they'll let a bad word fly. They'll tell a joke that's maybe a little off color, in my presence. They don't feel like they have to be somebody different. Why? Because that's what we're talking about right here. You see, you can't sit with us. You're not wearing pink on Wednesday. The church has felt like this for many, many years. The people, uh, I can't go in there because I don't dress like them. I don't even own a dress that looks like that. My dress comes right here and barely covers my butt. I don't have a shirt with a tie. I don't have any dockers with a belt, and I don't tuck my shirt in that's buttoned up. And a lot of the reason that I've dressed very casual in here is because I want people to realize when they come in here, I don't care how they dress. I'm glad they're here. I want them to be a part of us. It's this idea that you can't sit with us. The next one, we want to be mentored, not preached at. I love this one. I love this one because they speak exactly to what Jesus Christ did. What did Jesus Christ do? He came, he grew up, and he picked a bunch of jacked up guys. If you guys think the disciples, the apostles, were like good dudes, just read through the gospel again. They were a messed up crew of people. I mean, literally, they were messed up. And Jesus said, no, I want you, and I want you, and I want you. You know what blows me away? He chose Judas. He chose Judas knowing what Judas would do. He knew Judas would betray him. And he chose him and said, I want you to be one of the 12 people. I'm building, I'm coming here on mission, right? I'm starting a new movement on the earth with broken, busted up people. So I'm going to start with broken, busted up people. Knowing full well what Judas would do, he chose him to be part of his inner crew. I think that's awesome. I think what God did was he said, you know what? I'm going to go, I'm going to say, first off, the you can't sit with us idea. No, I'm. Jesus Christ, God in flesh, God incarnate came down and said, I'm going to sit with a tax collector. I'm going to have lunch and break bread with a man who is going to betray me. I, that just blows me away. Like many of us wouldn't, I mean, you ever picked a team on like dodgeball when you were a kid or something like that? You're like, oh yeah, who do we go for first? Right? Like the best and the strongest, the ones that can catch a ball. You know, everybody's always like worried about being what? picked last. The reality is, guys, we, if we knew Judas, we would have picked him last. Like, he never would have made the team of 12, ever. And Jesus said, no, you're in. You're in. 
the broken, the outcast, the least, the one he knew would betray him, you're inside the inner circle. You can sit with us. And then what I was saying, we want to be mentored, not preached at. See, Jesus didn't preach at his disciples. What did he say? He said, follow me. They asked him. He said, follow me. Like, leave everything behind and come with me and follow me. They want to be mentored. Millennials want to be mentored. They want to go out and do something that's making a difference, and they want to come alongside somebody who's doing it with them. And God will do amazing things in people's lives as we do things together. It, it's already happening here. That's why in some ways I'm, I'm throwing this out there because somebody's going to see this online, and some of us need it, you know, banged into our head a little bit more. This is why we do what we do. You know, they say vision leaks. This is a vision. This is who we're going to be. I want to pound it into our heads again because we're setting the tone again for a new year. We're going to go out and serve. We're going to do these things. Part of this is patting us on the back. Guys, we're doing this. I'm excited about who we're reaching and what we're doing. They want to be reached. They want to be mentored, not preached at. The next one, we want you to talk to us about controversial issues because no one is. No one is. Would you agree with me that there are controversial issues going on in our society today? There are huge controversial issues. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit into my notes. Last year when we were doing Royal Family Kids Camp, I met um, the director of Green Oak Ranch. His name is Brian Smith. He has the most plain Jane. I mean, it could have been John Doe, Brian Smith. I mean, literally, he is a plain Jane. That's how he introduced himself. He says, it's going to be very easy for you to remember my name. He says, because it's just very plain, Brian Smith. I said, that's your real name? He said, yes, that's my real name. But as we were there for the week, I popped in and out of his office. It was kind of cool. It's like we, we kind of had this this connection from the beginning, and he said, hey, I want you to have a key to my office. It's hot down here. It's air conditioned. If you ever want to pop in and talk, just, you know, come on in, and uh, so I did. I popped in a few times, and we had some conversations, and he just kept asking me questions, and he said, you know, I have church pastor after pastor after pastor come through here, and he said, there's something different about you. You don't talk like a pastor. He says, you don't say the same things. He says, I've grown up in church I think he said he was a pastor's kid. He says, you don't, you see things different. And he challenged me. He said, he, he said, you know, he said, I think you need to start a podcast or a video or a vodcast and you need to start talking about these things and having these conversations. This is where it ties back in. We want you to talk to us about controversial issues. See, there's a way to talk about controversial issues that brings people in. We don't do that very well. For one, I'm just, write this in your in your smartphone right now, don't talk about controversial issues on social media. Number one, it's a great place to not talk about so, social, uh, social issues. Just don't do it. All it does is start a fight. Flame wars. People get on there, and it doesn't matter how well you think you've crafted your loving response or your opinion on a particular issue or candidate online, somebody's going to find fault with it and just tear you up and then people are going to come to your aid and it's just going to be a little mini war right on your Facebook timeline or your Instagram feed. Just don't do it. But there has to be a way of having these conversations with people and millennials are saying we want to have these conversations. I'm going to jump forward again to something. This uh, a friend of mine, a coworker, he said... Um, because he calls me, you know, he calls me Pastor Jeremy anyways, and, uh, occasionally. And we were talking the other night. I, I don't like doing these overnights. I've been working from 5.30 to 2 a.m. because they've been polishing the, audit, the floor of the store, and we have to move stuff and wait till they're done and then close up. And I've been doing these overnights. And um, he and I, it's just usually a couple of us along with our manager that are there. And we've had some really good conversations um, about things that he's struggling with. And he's a little older. He's, he's not quite a, he's on the tail end of the millennial group, but he, he doesn't go to church much. And he says, I, you know, I don't see a whole lot of value in it, but he keeps asking me questions. And he says, man, I love, I love your viewpoint on that thing. And he says, I, need, I know I need to be a more, more like that, but it's so hard when my whole, you know, my whole demographic is just saying, this is the way it's supposed to be, and they're trying to jam it down my throat and calling me intolerant, and I'm not. He says, but I'm having a hard time being loving. 
I struggle with being loving and having those conversations. See, they want to be mentored and not preached at. They want to have controversial issues talked about. They want to feel like they're part of the process. They want to be involved where they feel like their life is going to make a difference. And he says, man, I love, I love what you're doing. He, a few times he's even joked. He says, hey, I'm going to be at your church on Sunday. He, but he's almost always working on Sunday mornings about this time. He's probably starting uh, generally about this time, except we're closed today. Um. But I believe that millennials, I, I believe honestly all of us want to have meaningful conversation. It's not just millennials. We want to have meaningful conversation about the issues that are impacting us and our families. There's been times when I, I've said to Janie, man, I, I'm kind of concerned that we had kids and we're raising them in this world. Everybody's so intolerant. Everybody's so, it's, the world is so broken, and we can't even have meaningful dialogue without getting in a fight anymore. It seems like tension is so high that the wick is so short that everything is just about to explode, even you know, with like this Black Lives Matter and the cops and all this. I mean, we, we've seen areas around the nation where public discourse has turned to riots, and literally, I believe our nation is, and it, it may not seem this way when you walk out there today, but I think our nation is on the precipice of riots everywhere because we don't treat anybody with respect. We can't have a conversation. We don't know anybody anymore. We don't have those relationships. And millennials are saying, this can't be the way that it stays. We want to do something that makes a difference and brings the dial back down. We want to get back from 9.9 .9 back to a 5 in the temperature of where our climate is in this nation. We want to do something about it. See, we will look back and say, man, they're not engaged. They don't go to church. These millennials, they're a worthless generation. And they're saying, no, the way you're going, what you've given us is worthless. And I don't want to be a part of your system, so we're going to try and do it another way. And I believe that if we engage millennials, I believe it can be a way for the church to continue on and to continue to thrive and actually grow and reach more people who are far from God. Guys, I'm, I'm 40 years old this year. 40 years old. I can't do, I'm not going to do this for another 25 years. I've got to find somebody who's going to carry this thing on and grow teams of people who are saying, you know what, we can do this. We buy into this. This thing's going to work. The local church is the hope of the world. It's, but we've got to make a difference. We've got to make a difference. The next one is public perception. It's time to focus on changing the public perception of the church within the community. The neighbors and city and people around our church building should be audibly thankful the congregation is part of their neighborhood. We should be serving the crap out of them. It's literally what it says here. I'm just reading it. I mean, I'd say that, but he wrote it, not me. Just the messenger. How, I can't tell you how many times churches are in battles with the city to be able to put a sign up or change the color. and You know why? Because they're not making a difference. And, and a lot of cities see churches as a drain on their community. And a lot of the communities think, oh, they just make a lot of noise. A lot of the neighbors don't like them because they're always having something, now, or always doing something, or their parking is spilling over into the streets. And, but the community is not saying, we love having the church here. Guys, that has to change. We, we have to change that perception. We have to change the public perception of what the church is about and who we are there for. And if we were making a difference in, if each church member was making a difference in their neighbor's life, we can begin that way in changing the public perception in our communities. The last one he talks about is you're failing to adapt. Here's the bottom line, church. You aren't reaching millennials. Enough with the excuses and the blame, we need to accept reality and intentionally move toward this generation that is terrifyingly anti-church. Bill Clinton said, the price of doing the same old thing is far higher than the price of change. Kakuzo Akakura. Kakuzu Akakura said, the art of life is constant readjustment to our surroundings. And H.G. Wells said, adapt or perish now as ever is nature's inexor inexorable imperative. Change. Because we don't like change. Change is hard. But we have to continually adapt. I say this, I, I feel like I'm always trying to learn and change my views 
because I want to be comfortable in uncomfortability. Does that make sense? Like I want to change, I want to change not on the main things, not that Jesus isn't Lord, not on the big, but the way that we go about doing things, I want to change in those things all the time so change becomes comfortable. Because the reality is if we're going to, our core value says what? Growing things what? Growing things change. You look at a sapling and it looks cool. You're like, oh, that's a cool sapling. Come back three weeks later, it'll be a little bit bigger and have different leaves on it. Growth is not a bad thing. Change is not a bad thing. Change and growth go hand in hand. And I want to be a type of person who changes regularly so I become comfortable with change. The problem with the church in the past is that we, we start to like what we like and then we just continue to do that for decades until a generation goes, you know what? We don't like that, and we don't like that thing that you're doing, and we're not going to be a part of it. And then there's drastic changes. But I believe that if the church were to adapt like a sapling grows, it doesn't hurt so much because you don't have to change very much to just con- as you continue to adapt along the way. The price of doing the same old thing is far higher than the price of change. We're losing a generation because we've failed to adapt You see, church leaders, our generation just isn't interested in playing church anymore. And there are real possible solutions to filling our congregations with young adults. It's obvious you're not understanding the gravity of the problem at hand and aren't nearly as alarmed as you should be about the crossroads we're at. The truth is, church, it's your move. He writes this. Decide if millennials actually matter to you and let us know. In the meantime, I want you to hear this. We'll be over here in sweatpants listening to podcasts, serving the poor, and agreeing with public opinion that perhaps church isn't as important or worthwhile as our parents have led us to believe. I'm going to read that again. Decide if millennials actually matter to you and let us know. In the meantime, we'll be over here in our sweatpants, listening to podcasts, serving the poor, and agreeing with public opinion that perhaps church isn't as important or worthwhile as our parents have led us to believe. They want to do something about it, but they're just waiting for the church to catch up and say, all right, we've got to, take, we've got to make a move. See, they're not interested in playing church. I want this church community to be about not playing church. I want us to run towards messes. I want us to do life with people. When you see each other here on Sunday or out the, throughout the week where we're serving, I want you guys to genuinely have love and affection for one another. I want us to look forward to being together in whatever we're doing the next time we get together. I don't care. This is what I say. I don't care what we do as long as I'm doing it with you. That's what I want our attitude to be. If we're making a difference out there, I don't care what we're doing as long as I'm doing it with you. And I want you to feel the same way with me. That as we love one another and we love and serve our God, as we serve our neighbors, we come closer together and God grows us continually day by day and we adjust and make minor adjustments and change a lot over time instead of waiting for these decade-long, huge adjustments that have to happen in the church. Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says this, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Stop. I believe that's exactly what we've done as the church. We've lit a lamp and we've put a building over the top of it. And we've hidden the light of the world. We've hidden the light of the world. We've got to take the cover off the top and let the light shine again. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house in the same way. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good... What's the next word? What? Good deeds... See, millennials are saying, we want to do good deeds. It doesn't say good intentions. As a church, we've been really good at having good intentions. But millennials are screaming, we're tired of your good intentions. We want to do the good deeds we've been talking about. They said that. Let's stop talking about it and let's just go do it. 
Let's not even talk about it. Let's just go out there and see what happens. Let's go do it and see what God intended for us to do. See, that's how I believe Jesus led his disciples. He said, let's just go. Let's get on the road. We're going to the next town. And whatever happens, oftentimes in the Bible, it'll say, and on the way. And along the way, they came across a man on the road to. It wasn't where they were going. See, God intervenes in our timeline as we're going. What millennials are saying is let's go just do something and see what God had planned along the way. And that's the kind of church that I want to be. Not based on good intentions, but on good deeds. Instead, they put it on a stand and gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your shine, let your light shine before others. They may see your good deeds and give glory to your Father in heaven. That's what we want. It's for every man, woman, and child to give glory to the Father in heaven. But for them to see God's glory, we must do what? Good deeds. We must do good deeds. To reach the people we need to reach, we have to change the church. I don't dislike the church. I love the local church. I will serve God's local church to the day that I die, and I'll give everything that I can to see people, man, woman, and child, do the same thing as long as we're getting out there and we're doing something. And God's doing something along the way. I can tell you all the things that we planned to do last year and all the things that God did along the way far outnumber the things that we planned to do in the way that he just chose to do life change and bring people among us and blow us up with these different stories and what God's doing in our lives because he wants to make a difference on the way. We just got to get out there and do it. We got to meet people along the way. See, America needs a transformed church, a rekindled compassion and love of neighbor. And millennials are saying, the next generation is saying, when you get that, we'll be with you. There's the hope that I have. There's the hope that I have. We won't only reach millennials. There are people in other age demographics. There are people, there's another study that says people are leaving the church because they feel like they're, and they're older, 40s, 50s, 60s. And they're saying, you know what, I just can't go to another church service on Sunday. I'm just tired of it. I'll, I'll go there. It's the same thing. That just as a generation, they're not doing the same thing the millennials are doing and not coming back to church. They're tapping out on the other end. They're like, man, I did Sunday school for years. I taught Sunday school. I did that thing. I served there and inside the church. I did all this stuff, and I just can't go and sing the same song again and hear the same message I've heard a hundred times. Let's go do something. So that's my challenge today, Activate Church. Let's get on this thing and continue to do more. Thank you for doing what you're doing. See, this last year we served hundreds of people. I'm not exaggerating. We served hundreds of people and spent thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars on meeting people's needs. Many of the people who actually are not here this morning are here as a result of us having a desire to go out and serve people. They love that we do that. There are people here this morning who are a part of this congregation and our community of faith because we went out and met them on a Sunday, because we went and met them on a Wednesday, on a Tuesday when we were serving, or we asked them to come alongside us and serve the least of these with us. This last year, we took 38 kids, foster kids. See, I talked about Annie at the beginning, and it's real easy for me to talk about maybe even one of our little ones, a new, our little new Dimitri. You know, we've thrown it out to you. Hey, whatever they need, let's get this stuff for him. Like when it's Dimitri, man, we'll buy him. If he needs diapers, cool. If he needs clothes, we can all take care of that need. If he need, what's he need, a new bicycle or a new scooter, a little skateboard? What does the kid want? And we can all take care of that, right? But then it gets to the Royal Family Kids Camp, foster care, 400,000 kids in America that don't have parents. Okay, I don't know. But what do we say? We can make a difference for one. In the summer, we made a difference for 38 of them. We spent over $36,000 to make a difference in their lives. And those kids' lives will be changed. We know it because Royal Family Kids Camp has been around so long that kids who went to camp are coming back to be counselors and saying, that was a week of my life or 
three years in a row, three weeks of my life, I still have the treasures that I got. And sometimes it's the only thing they have left from their childhood. And they kept hold of that Bible or that note from their counselor that put hope in their life. Because people are waiting for us to inject hope into their lives. And we did that this past year. We've inspired other congregations just by me being part of a pastor's group to go out and start serving. You see, I, I always hope that that we would be able to meet with other churches and do things with other churches to get the church. See, we can't make a difference all on our own, but as we get out and serve, the church down the street is going to go, oh, that Activate Church, the community is saying things. What are they doing? Oh, they're just getting out and serving people? It's not like a new curriculum or a model or a new church model they're doing. They're, they're doing what? And, and one of my pastor friends, for sure, they said, man, we weren't doing anything. And we started going out and we started doing the laundry love. He says, we're having all kinds of people that we're bouncing into and meeting. And, and our people are energized to go and do something. And now there's 15 or 20 churches who are saying, you know, we've got to make a difference in this city. And we actually have a meeting, I think, in a few weeks, January, to find out what we're going to do this summer together as the church to change what the community thinks about the church in Huntington Beach. I've seen life change in many of you in your willingness to step up, in your generosity, in some of your own emotional, personal battles and hurt. And I'm so excited to have those things happening in this community of faith we call our church. I'm so excited to have those happening. We get to partner with other organizations and churches. We did partner with Grandma's House of Hope and Royal Family Kids Camp and there's been some other ones and we've reached hundreds of people and you guys have served your faces off and I love doing it with you. I'm sure we've changed perceptions of the church and I'm sure we've torn down walls and hopefully we're kicking the where's your pink on Wednesday. People are coming. You know, our sign says you don't have to believe like us to be with us and I've had two people that don't go to this church, that I met at Costco, one works there, one didn't, that said they knew of our church and quoted what the sign says. That means something. That means something. They're not here yet, but I believe God's planting the seed in their heart. They're saying, when I go to church, that's a church I'm going to go to. When something happens in my life, that's where I want to be. And as we go out and serve and as we go out and touch lives, when people say, you know what, I'm ready for Jesus. Who was that church again? Oh, yeah, that was that church that came and gave out donuts and handed out bags at the pier. Yeah, that's, I want to be a part of that kind of community. See, that's what the church as a whole has to change into. And we've, we're doubling down on that this year. We're going to continue on. We're going to do more through your generosity and through your love and through your life change and growth. We are going to reach far more people this year than we did last year. And we're going to inspire other local churches to do more and more because of you guys' involvement, your involvement in what we're doing. And I want to say a huge thank you. Thank you for believing in this. Thank you for being part of this. Thank you for giving your energy and your time. Thank you for praying Thank you for coming alongside and just giving a hug when someone needed a hug. Thank you for doing what you're doing. This year we're going to love the unlovable and we're going to touch the untouchable. We're going to chase down the outcast. We're going to sit with sinners and invite them into our homes. And we're going to invite in the outsiders. That's what we're going to do. Why? Because that's what Jesus does. You know what we're going to do? We're going to leave the 99 because we're all part of the 99 in here, and we're going to go out and find the one. I don't know who that one is going to be, but they'll sit there, and they'll sit there, and they'll serve with us out there, and they'll be in your living room, and we'll have lunch with them and coffee with them. God is going to do some amazing things this year. I'm excited to be a part of it, and I'm saying this, we've got to reach this young generation. They're not really young. This, they're, they're a family generation. And we've got to reach them.